This video is brought to you by friend of the channel Squarespace. Stick around to learn more about how their intuitive website creation tools help people turn their hobbies into careers and dreams into reality. Concord. Hmm. All right. So I put about 10 hours into the beta for this one over the weekend. That was meant to be a pre-order beta and it was, but in addition to pre-orders, Sony also opened it up to anyone with a PS Plus membership. That was an announcement that happened at the 11th hour. And so you have to assume that the only reason Sony did this was because pre-order numbers are very soft. That's a theory supported by the player count numbers we saw on Steam over the weekend. Now, given that this was available to PS Plus members for free, means that there very likely would have been plenty more people playing on PS5. But PC is a huge focus for Sony with their live service games. Hell, that's the reason why Helldivers 2 did as well as it did. So if Concord isn't doing big numbers on PC, that's gonna be a huge disappointment for Sony. So how did Concord do on PC over the weekend? Well, it peaked at just 1,124 players. That peak happened the minute the game went live, and the numbers just went down, down, down after that. And I would remind you that when you pre-ordered Concord, you actually got not one, but five beta codes to share amongst your friends. In that context, these pre-order numbers are likely even more dire than what this concurrent player count is hinting at. The soft pre-order numbers are a reflection of what was an overwhelmingly negative response to the game when it was revealed during Sony's most recent state of play. There, they ran a super long cinematic trailer introducing us to the world and characters. And I think much of it could be described as like Timu Guardians of the Galaxy. It was so one to one with Marvel's iconic sci-fi franchise that it felt almost on the nose, making Concord look rather derivative. The gameplay trailer did little to arrest that narrative. It was revealed that Concord was another hero shooter when it feels like the market has well and truly moved on from that genre some time ago. Nothing in the trailer really stood out as being particularly unique or interesting. There wasn't a hook that made people sit up and pay attention, and coupled with those criticisms of the story and characters, it was a very rough reveal for Concord. Personally, I was holding out hope for this one for two reasons. Number one, Sony bought Firewalk Studios after having played Concord. They like what they saw so much that they thought, we must own this studio. Sony have a pretty good eye for what's good and what's not, so that filled me with a fair amount of optimism for what Concord might be. Secondly, Concord is being made by a bunch of shooter veterans who have worked on stuff like Call of Duty, Halo, and Destiny. And just by looking at that gameplay trailer alone, you could absolutely see the Destiny influence in many parts of this game. And I think that all to Concord's benefit. Say what you will about Destiny, and there's a lot to say, but the core shooting mechanics and class design are S tier, and I was hopeful that some of that would make its way into Concord. I'm pleased to tell you that it absolutely has. By far and away, the biggest strengths of Concord are its solid mechanics and its innovative class kits, some of which are just borrowing wholesale from Destiny, but remixing them in ways that feel like iteration rather than plagiarism. In these aspects, Concord really distinguishes itself and does make a compelling case why you might want to play this over Overwatch or Fortnite or Apex or Valorant or whatever. But games like these are not measured by the virtues of one or two of their elements alone, but rather by looking at the whole package. Visuals, level design, game mode, structure, progression, and monetization. In almost all of these areas, Concord does very little to distinguish itself, except in the fact that it's daring to charge $40 for a game that many consumers would expect to be able to play for free at this point. Concord's levels are functional to the point of being rather lifeless, the game modes are highly derivative and do not seem to properly leverage the strength of the sandbox that Firewalk have built. The progression is slow and wholly uninteresting, centered on generic cosmetics like weapon charms and emblems. Most alarmingly, for a game out in just over a month, there are some seriously unfinished systems rolling around in here, like a character selection, variant, and team loadout system, all of which are so messy to understand and utilize, and that really feel like things that are designed to constrain your fun rather than enhance them. I've seen some positive sentiment for this one, sure, absolutely, but you know what I haven't seen? Actual excitement. I do believe this is a good game, but I also feel as though it's not ready for launch, be that in terms of game design, in terms of marketing awareness, and in terms of its business model. Concord is just over a month from launch, and right now it feels like it's sleepwalking into its fate as yet another live service cautionary tale. There's gonna be any basket today, buddy. Concord revealed itself with an elaborate story cutscene for good reason. Because story is a major component of the Concord experience. So much so that Firewall claim they're gonna be doing weekly story drops, incentivizing you to log in each week to see where things will go next. We've got a small taste of that story here in this beta. There were two major cutscenes on offer. Let's take a look at one of them now. Why are you kissing a tchotchke? This is an authentic item from the Starship in Plac. How do you two not know about the implacable? How old are you now? Old enough to know legends matter. Thank you, Captain.
So full credit where it's due. This is pretty good stuff. We talk a lot about the bars set by the Guardians of the Galaxy games when it comes to stuff like voice acting and facial animations. So it's a little ironic that Concord, a game heavily inspired by the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, seems to also be inspired by the game, at least insofar as it relates to facial animations, character details, and voice acting. Firewalker absolutely delivering a level of presentation that feels like they're punching above their weight, given that this is a debut title for the studio, and I do wonder if they had some help from Sony's other studios while putting this stuff together, since Sony games have put a huge premium on facial work, animations, etc. for a long time now. The writing is also pretty good, to be honest. It's not enough to get me fully on board with this, but it's enough to pique my interest, and I hope that Concord has a nice dollop of this stuff at the start when the game launches, rather than holding it all back for a weekly drip feed. If you can give me a strong, self-contained story at launch, something I can experience fully in the 15 to 30 hours I'll be spending playing this in August, then there's a chance I might become invested in all this. But if you're gonna give me 90 second cutscenes and then tell me to come back next week, there's a good chance that me and a bunch of other people will not come back next week. At a high level, I'm really skeptical of the idea of weekly story beats in a hero shooter, especially ones that clearly cost this much to make. It takes a tremendous amount of resources to create even these small cutscenes, and to promise them weekly seems like a huge allocation of budget that might be better spent on other things. I don't know, Bungie do weekly story beats during their seasons, but only for like the first six weeks, and then they just chill on that stuff for the next six weeks until the next season begins. And Bungie is huge, by the way. I'm not sure how Firewalk, a much smaller studio, is going to be able to maintain that sort of cadence over the longer term, or even why they'd want to. A weekly story cutscene is not going to be the thing that makes Concord successful, and I do wonder if the studio hasn't saddled themselves with a little too much story overhead when that throughput could have been put to work on core game features. Because even right now, five weeks from launch, there is a lot of work to be done on core game features, but we'll get to that stuff. Firstly, let's be super clear on what Concord is and is not. Concord is a PvP hero shooter. It does not have a PvE mode at all, or if it does, Firewalk have not mentioned it. Its roster is 16 heroes at launch with the promise of more to be added in the future. There are six PvP modes spread out across three playlists, and those playlists determine how competitive you want the experience to be. That's a really crucial thing to understand about Concord. You can pull in comparisons like Destiny 2 and Overwatch and Valorant, and the reason you can do that is because Concord is trying to be all of those things at once. Imagine a spectrum with like Halo and Destiny PvP arena shooting at one end, and tactical shooters like Valorant or Rainbow Six at the other. Concord has different game modes across that spectrum. So you can load into one game mode and it's just a spammy TDM arena shooter, and then you can enter the rivalry playlist and it's game modes where you have to plant and defend a bomb with limited revives and limitations on which heroes can be picked based on which heroes you've already played or the ones you've added to your pre-built roster. We'll get to all that later. So that already makes Concord an interesting proposition because most of the time, these games tend to commit to one level of competitiveness or another and their game modes are built around that. So Siege is not a game designed around team deathmatch, just the same way that Halo does have more competitive game modes, but it's clearly built around TDM style play that's where it really thrives. Concord is aiming to cast a wider net, and so far I think it's finding success. I split my time equally between the casual playlist and the competitive focus one, and both worked well. I do think that some heroes feel like they belong better in one queue or another, while other heroes feel extremely versatile, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. There's a good mix of generic versus specialized class design here, and that's allowed the game to work at both ends of the competitive spectrum. As to what those game modes are, I'll be honest and say that they're pretty disappointing, and definitely one of the most uninspired and derivative aspects of Concord. One of them is a team deathmatch, another is kill confirmed where you just need to run over the corpse of an enemy to collect a point. Three of them involve capturing spots on the map with some different modifiers applied to ratchet up the competitive stakes and tension. And the last one is the bomb planting from Siege or Valorant or CSGO or whatever. We've all seen these game modes dozens of times before and all of them exist in games that we can play right now for free. So yeah, it would have been cool to see Concord innovate here a little or a lot more. The same could be said of level design, which is equally bland and derivative. So again, to their credit, the levels are functional play spaces with a mix of three lane highways and center focused arenas. They all have plenty of space with which to operate in, crucial for a game with so many characters who operate vertically. They all have good choke points and sight lines and all of it. Like I said, they're functionally very well built but they're just pretty boring and lifeless and bland. One of the maps is a kind of nondescript cargo looking area. Another one is a sort of DE dust style aesthetic. The only one that actually stands out is this one, which on the outside looks like this creepy castle thing. And inside it has this weird glowing mushroom thing in the center. 
But that's one map with a hint of personality where everything else just feels so utilitarian. Compare this to the level of personality and detail in Overwatch levels or even Destiny 2's PvP maps and it's chalk and cheese, for real. Given how much personality and inventiveness have been poured into each of these characters, the blandness of the level design seems a very stark contrast. And that's a neat segue to talk about how much Concord is nailing its central and most important elements, the combat and the hero kits. There are 16 heroes available at launch. It's not clear if all of them are going to be unlocked right away, but I assume they will be. By and large, each of them is really unique and brilliantly designed, and there were very few heroes I didn't enjoy playing. There are some, dare I say, phoned in heroes. This dude right here is basically just Soldier 76 2.0, right down to the battle rifle and the grenades and the movement boost, all of it. This dude here is just Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, at least visually and in terms of his dialogue, and his character kit is little more than just dude with a shotgun. Really not that much to him. Gonna break the destruction. But then there's Baz, for example, who is a melee-focused character who does big up-close damage, can fling knives at distant targets, and can track targets through walls when she's crouching. There's Itz, who throws out a bouncy ball and reactivating that ability teleports her to wherever the ball is. There's this fucked up mushroom freak who leaves these little spores all over the battlefield that buffs allies and damages enemies. Plus, they can teleport back to a little pod they place wherever they like. Complete. There's also this giant walking vacuum cleaner, for real. This dude hoovers up garbage so he can then convert it to trash bombs and a deployable pad that deflects projectiles. The enemy sees me. So those are just a few of the more interesting character kits, but there are literally 10 or more kits that are just as interesting and fun to use, while also having a really high skill ceiling, since most of what's on offer here falls into that easy to learn, tough to master thing, especially when it comes to synergizing with your teammates. And that's a huge deal here, because there's absolutely some broad archetypes that characters fall into. There are tanks, heal, support players, assassins, and sustained DPS. So these role types do exist, but no character is overly constrained by these role types. So two of the healers both still have excellent DPS output, and similarly, your tanks can output a huge amount of damage under the right conditions. Some of the DPS and assassin type characters are able to buff teammates in different ways, and can even heal themselves based on what they're doing. In this way, class design mirrors that of Destiny 2, where classes are a lot more freeform with what they're bringing to the table, rather than being pigeonholed the way that someone like a Mercy or a Reinhardt is. Where things get even more interesting is that a number of heroes are able to deploy things like mines or sensors or healing pads or whatever, and these things actually persist from one round to the next when you're playing those more competitive game modes. This provides a bit of an incentive to use those deployed type characters early on so you can litter the map with these persistent objects, and then maybe switch to a different hero in later rounds once you're happy with all that setup work. That's a cool concept, right? I like it, and I can definitely see how it's going to add a layer of strategy to those more sweaty, competitive matches between teams who know how to make use of this stuff. On a more foundational level, it just feels really good to play this, and scanning all the chatter about this game, I'm yet to see anyone that says that this isn't a well-made shooter, because it absolutely is. Movement can be a little slow for certain characters, especially the tanks. By and large, things like jumping, mantling, weapon feedback, melee, hit registration, all of it is extremely sound, and definitely reflects the years of experience that these veteran developers have brought to the table here. It's also just in great shape technically. I played it on a high-end PC and it ran flawlessly. I had zero bugs or crashes and the netcode seemed excellent. People on PS5 are also reporting excellent performance, so that's great. A real shout out to the sound work here. Not only does this game have plenty of very satisfying sound effects to sell the uniqueness of each character and their abilities, but positional audio is superb. You can absolutely hear approaching footsteps from around a corner, which is crucial given that there's no minimap to rely on. You can also hear the sounds of distant gunfire really clearly so you know exactly where it's coming from, and you can choose to either move toward it or away from it. Audio here is genuinely top-notch, and I absolutely recommend playing this with a set of headphones because making use of all that positional audio information is going to give you a huge advantage whilst playing. All right, so that's all the stuff that's really great about Concord. Now I want to drill down into some things that are a mix of disappointing or bad or just weird.
So one of the things that's interesting about Concord is that none of the heroes have any ultimate abilities. That's fairly rare across the hero shooter genre, and for good reason. Ultimates are not only really fun, but they play an important role in strategy and pacing. Ultimates can turn the tide of a battle really suddenly, and the threat of them keeps everyone on their toes, even when an enemy team has a commanding lead. Now that's not to say that every shooter needs to have ultimates, but I do think that ultimates would kind of fit here in Concord, because most of the games that I played were absent any sort of game-changing moments or crescendos or whatever. They usually felt like the overall outcome of the game was determined in the first few opening kills, and after that, the rest of the game was just everyone kind of going through the motions. An ultimate might be the thing to help spice things up a little bit, put you back in the game where before all looked hopeless. Interestingly though, Concord has its own solution to this problem of snowballing teams and tension and momentum and all that sort of stuff, but it's incredibly convoluted, and I think it's quite anti-fun, and it's going to take me a little bit of time to explain, so bear with me. The starting point to understand all of this is to know that in the competitive game modes, they implemented what's called Variant Knockout. What that means is that if you win a round in a competitive mode, you cannot then play the same hero variant in the next round or any other rounds. You need to pick a different variant. This would, in theory, get you playing different characters and really spice up the overall flow of battle since everyone is flexing different picks instead of riding their main 24-7. Now that's a great idea if your goal is to make a balanced and competitive shooter, but it's not very fun to limit people's ability to play their favorite hero, given that hero shooters are very much about that relationship to a favorite hero, where you invest hundreds of hours to master them, and you're really into their character design and their lore, and you've collected all their cosmetics, etc, etc. You just don't get to play your favorite hero a lot of the time here, especially given that these competitive modes also have sequential picking, meaning that if someone on your team picks that character first, then you're fresh out of luck. In addition to this, Firewalk have implemented this stacking passive buff system. Each hero is allocated what's called a role, and it's not like tank, DPS, healer, or whatever, it's other names like tactician, or haunt, or warden, or stuff like that. When a person on your team selects and plays with a hero, their role passive is permanently added to the passive pool for the party. So if I select a tactician hero, then everyone on my team gets faster reload speed for all of their weapons for this and every subsequent round. Another role will grant a shorter dodge time reset. Another adds bonus healing, etc, etc. There are six of these bonuses and they stack across your team, meaning that you can get a lot of bonus reload if everyone on your team is selecting heroes that grant bonus reload speed. So this is interesting, but again, you're now in a position where you're really incentivized to pick characters that bring the desired passive buffs rather than just picking the characters that you want to play or that you're good at playing or that are just fun to play. Again, it's another great idea on paper if your goal is a well-balanced competitive shooter experience, but it's not a great idea if you want your players to just play what they want and have fun. It also must be said that the way all of this is explained to players is terrible. It's all just this big in-game text menu right now, so I really hope the tutorial properly tackles this when that's available. Furthermore, the way it's surfaced in the character selection UI is abysmal. In, in character select, all you get are these little tiny icons that you can barely make out with no interface to show you more clearly or to remind you what these icons might mean. If all of this sounds weird and confusing, then buckle up because it's about to get way worse. So recall what I said earlier. In competitive modes, they use what's called variant elimination, meaning you can't pick the same hero variant if you won using that variant in a previous round. That term variant is used very deliberately because you can actually have up to three of the same heroes on your roster so long as they're different variants. And this is where we get to the concept of the crew roster. So the hero variant selection screen that you and I see is going to be different based on which hero variants we have added to our crews. I get to add 12 variants. I can add up to three variants of the same hero but crews must have at least five unique heroes, so I can't just choose three copies of the same four heroes. Outside of that core crew that I build, I'm also going to be able to see a number of backup picks. These are automatically selected by the game to fill for different playstyles or role needs, ideally incentivizing me to flex pick into something that is good for the team. So I couldn't do it in the beta, but we've mocked this up. This is what a hero selection screen could look like if I configured it this way. Three variants of three heroes, and then three more other heroes that I've selected, and then four backup suggestions that rotate each new round based on what the team needs. Are you still with me? No? Good, because it gets worse. 
What is a variant? Is it just another copy of the same hero? Well, basically, yes, but the only difference here is that there's one passive buff different between each variant. So on this Yondu looking jabroni right here, one of the passives will reload his weapons when he dodges. Shout out to the hunter mains, by the way. The other variant just gives him more ammo for both of his guns. That's it. That's the only difference between one variant and another. And you need to unlock these variants by grinding for them in weekly challenges or whatever. So if all of this seems needlessly convoluted, then get a load of this final touch. Each variant can be customized uniquely. And if you apply one customization to one variant, you cannot then apply the same customization to another variant. You will get an error message being like, this is assigned to another variant. And you can't customize that variant before unequipping that outfit or whatever from the other variant. It is genuinely baffling why Firewalk would design it this way. It's just, I, I don't understand. So think about all that. A character picking system that stops you from playing with the characters that you're winning with, one that is dependent upon stacking team buffs that are confusing and not properly explained or surfaced by the UI, all of which could be sort of sidestepped if you just stacked your character select screen with multiple copies of the same hero, which would then limit your ability to flex pick a different character if that's what your team needed. And you also can't customize two variants with the same look because reasons? All of these ideas feel like design whiteboard scribblings that haven't been properly tested in the player's hands because they haven't. Like Overwatch and Valorant, for example, had months of beta testing before their official release. Concord is having its first closed beta test five weeks before its official release. It just doesn't feel ready. I mean, just as another example, right now in the competitive queue, there is no leavers penalty for leaving a game early. So what always happens is that people will queue, they'll lose the first round, and then they'll just leave and they'll re-queue because there's no penalty for doing so. Developing a properly functioning and calibrated leavers penalty system is not an easy task for a game like this. And it's just not in there yet. A game that launches five weeks from now. Coupled with some serious hero balancing issues that I've seen along the way, and those other underbaked, convoluted, and poorly explained systems, Concord just doesn't feel ready to launch. And that feels like a death sentence for a competitive hero shooter trying to charge $40 up front. So that's Concord, or more specifically, that's what I've seen of Concord so far. And I want to reiterate that there is going to be more content in the live game. There's going to be the proper in-game tutorial. There's more story stuff, fingers crossed. There's a bunch of new maps. There's, you know, the full customization stuff and the in-game shop, etc., etc. More importantly, that's where we're going to see a critical mass of players step in and begin figuring out how to actually play this game, because Concord is deceptively broad in terms of its gameplay styles. It can be a pretty straightforward arena shooter like Destiny or COD, or it can be a very tactical, objective-based team shooter like Overwatch or Valorant. Any game reliant on team play takes a while to find its feet, and so it's risky to prejudge Concord before the player base has got to grips with everything, as your enjoyment of Concord is going to be greatly influenced by how knowledgeable and cooperative the members of your team are. We may see some more of these game elements in the open beta scheduled to be held this coming weekend, and I really hope we do, because otherwise I would be very worried about how the launch of Concord is going to go. Let's be real, there is no buzz behind this one right now, like none. That's manifesting in a lack of pre-orders, a lack of positive sentiment across social media, and a general lack of chatter at all. It feels like no one's really talking about this one, and it's one of Sony's biggest releases for 2024, and it's out in five weeks. It's almost bleedingly obvious, but the $40 price point for this feels like an absurd barrier to entry given the type of game that this is. Think about what you could be playing instead that fits into the same general category. Overwatch 2, Destiny 2, Fortnite, Apex Legends, Paladins, The Finals, or even Marvel Rivals, which gets a beta later this month and launches soon after that, I'm sure. All of these games are free. And so the question immediately becomes is, is Concord doing enough to pull you away from those free options? And I will tell you, as someone that likes this game and is ultimately rooting for its success, I don't think it's doing enough to pull people away from those other experiences. Having played 10 or so hours, I'd be okay to play some more of it, 
but I certainly wouldn't be going out of my way to convince my friend group to spend a collective $200 between us so we could all play this game together. I, I genuinely think my friends would laugh in my face if I tried to convince them to do that. It seems almost ridiculous to say it aloud given the momentum of game development and marketing cycles, but if there is any way that Concord can be delayed a little or a lot, I think it would be for the best. A little delay would allow some extra betas to nail down the balance issues, while also letting us see more of the game so the core community can get acquainted with maps, mechanics, and character kits, and obviously provide feedback to Firewalk along the way. A slightly longer delay would allow Firewalk to rework these character selection, variant, and roster systems, which right now feel just like a massive pain in the ass. It's really hard to wrap your head around just how bad these systems are in their current forms, and given how much it impacts the round-based game modes, these things feel like a ticking time bomb ready to explode the moment people actually figure out just how much more fun they could be having with Concord if these things didn't exist. If you were to go for a much bigger delay, that might allow Firewalk to convert to a free-to-play business model. And let's be real, it's gonna end up free-to-play at some point anyway, right? It's just a question of whether Sony are willing to lose those day one sales from the handful of people who are willing to pay that 40 bucks. Maybe this is already factored into the plan, and Concord will have a muted paid launch, which will serve as a sort of paid early access period before pivoting to a free-to-play model, compensating those that paid with some in-game cosmetics or something. I don't know, but look, this just honestly doesn't feel quite ready to go. Not from a game design and balancing perspective, not from a marketing perspective, and not from a business model perspective. This feels undercooked in a way that Sony games never are, and I think a little more time in the oven might be worthwhile because there are some great ideas here, and I would love for this to do well, but I struggle to see how this game in its current form, in its current business model, is going to stand a chance in this current climate when there are so, so many other free alternatives that are already doing this thing, and in many cases doing it a hell of a lot better. Every day, I feel lucky to do what I do. I was working a job I wasn't loving and eventually tried my hand at content creation. It worked, and all these years later, here I am. I was lucky for a lot of reasons, but one of the big reasons was that YouTube existed, and so there was this platform for me that I could use to turn my dream into a reality. What if the website you need to turn your hobby into a career doesn't exist? What if you want to sell the ceramics that you make or photos that you take? What if you want to provide physiotherapy to people in your local area or promote a stall you run at a weekend farmer's market? What if you want to do to build a business? Having a website is generally going to be very helpful, and there's no better place to build a website than Squarespace. Squarespace offer intuitive but powerful website creation tools. Never made a website before? Then Squarespace is for you, letting you customize their beautiful templates in no time. Already feel pretty comfortable with web creation tools and want more advanced functionality? Well, Squarespace is for you too, with features like SEO, plugins for numerous payment platforms, a schedule tool allowing clients to book appointments, as well as detailed analytics allowing you to track how your website is performing. Since 2003, Squarespace has been helping people turn their dreams into reality. So if there's a passion that you'd like to make a career, then check out Squarespace for free by visiting squarespace.com. And when you're ready to get serious, use offer code SKILLUP at checkout for 10% off your purchase of a domain name. Thanks Squarespace for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.